Welcome, everyone. Welcome, welcome, welcome. It's Wednesday, and you know what that means. True House Stories Day. Welcome, everyone, in. We're so excited, so, so excited to have such a giant from our music industry. Boy, I can't wait to bring him up. I'm going to bring him up in a moment, but I want to thank, you know, last week for a wonderful show, everybody tuning in. And I noticed that because these festivals are going on around the world, people are going out and dancing. You better get your dance on. Hurry up and get your dance on because I got a funny, funny, funny feeling. And we were talking about with this particular artist. Well, I'm going to introduce in a moment that we actually may be reversing from the dance floor and going back to the pillows and sheets nightclubs in your house. So, <laughs> so we have to deal with it. We'll deal with it. But first, I want to say as well, welcome to True House Stories. I am Lenny Fontana coming out of New York City, Nueva York, and it's caliente and super hot, baby. And if it was Disco 92 day, we would say, welcome to WKTU Disco 92. And like Paco used to say, drink some El Pico with your disco. But since now we're going forward in time, I am so blessed to bring this wonderful He's an actor. He's part of after. He'll let he'll tell you all that. He's part of. He's been in movies, TV commercials. He's danced the damn song. We've actually danced together. The former president couldn't even do it correctly. He would he would come on and do it as well. He couldn't even do the YMCA. Pot, pot. I don't even want to go down that road because then we will get political and all. But I would like to introduce the two hour stories. Senor Felipe Ross. Felipe Ross. Hey, hey everyone. Ooh. That's the official greeting. Hey, how are you? Happy Wednesday. Thank you. And I caught him in the palatial palace in his mansion. No, far from in it. Huge, he's he is he <laughs> is rich with love and he has rich in history. He is here. And he's on True House Stories, and he is healthy, vaccinated, and ready to tell us. And he may not even crack fire at me when we do talk about certain things. But Oh, okay. No, I won't. I won't. Okay. Because he said he me. said to me nicely, he says, you can ask me whatever you like. I will answer. <laughs> I said, please don't get angry at me. No, if I, if I don't put these on, I won't, I'm not able to see you. But look how good he looks. Look how fabulous he looks. I didn't want to tell you his age. He looks fabulous. 67, 67. It's all good. 67. 67. Ten yeah. age of 67. Look, God bless. Really young in my family. My dad, he looks like he's in his late 60s, and he's 86. God bless. He's a, he's a native in the family. Um, but thank you for having me on, on your show. Um, I've been catching your show throughout the summer. You had Linda Clifford on. She is amazing. Yes. She and I are old colleagues, and we've been on, on God, we've toured together through the years. In fact, last year, we were all fortunate to be together for the ultimate disco cruise. Yes. You had 3,500 people, 2,700 crew, and then like 25 acts. You had Lenny, uh, Denny Terrio. Linda Clifford, Martha Wash, Anita Ward, um, Lucy from Chic, The Tramps, Travaris, uh, Casey and the Sunshine Band, um, oh, George McCray, lovely man. Um, God, it, the list went on, and it was dancing for five straight days and five straight nights, okay? And I was there, and I was booked in the Disco Studio 54 portion of the evening with legendary... DJ Nikki Siano, and I went and did Nikki, my team. Nikki is, I know Nikki very well. He's yeah. A ball of energy, a ball of energy, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. He's he's quite, quite, he's amazing still, you know. is I love that he can really take you down memory, memory lane. He'll play songs where he knows that you are going to lose your mind saying, I remember this song. Sure. Um, so he, he would, he performed, and he would start at 11.30 in the evening. So after everyone danced and went to concerts and all that, then people changed after dinner, relaxed, then went to the club, 
and that's where it's two tiers, and they were duplicated the, the the place that made it look like it was uh uh the Odyssey uh, in Brooklyn, you know, with the lit dance floor. Oh, they did like Odyssey, okay, like Odyssey, right? Huge three tier Bay Ridge, right? Huge three tier stage. That's where they filmed Saturday Night Fever, um, and uh, and I went on at one o'clock in the morning. Love that. It wasn't late for me. That's actually pretty good. Prime time for me. It's prime so, time, right? Prime so time. It was great. I enjoyed it. And, and five days, and when we got back on the 15th, and I thought, oh, man, I had such a good time and well-received. And I went, I, was, I went with dancers and plus picked up four more for, for my show. Um, I decided I'm going to you know, make my show longer. Came home. I was supposed to go to the Studio 54 uh, uh, exhibit at the Brooklyn... Uh, Museum of Art uh, for the Studio 54 exhibit, if I'm not mistaken. And That's right. We went into we went into lockdown. I was going to ask you how did COVID go, so you could take us there. Now you could bring us. But, there. Yeah, well, it was uh, you know suddenly you couldn't go out. You, you know, couldn't go anywhere. Everything started closing. Broadway closed. Um, I know that Linda Clifford and Martha Wash were supposed to go to that exhibit as well, and um, I don't know where the exhibit is. It's traveling around the world somewhere in Europe. Uh, then it was just became more of a uh, of a solitary confinement if you were with people or like me i was living alone so i had my my animals with me so i basically had the television social media and i got through a lot of dj's came through for us on social media on facebook entertaining us playing music for us and kept it going you know a lot of drag shows to call like I that but you know you you caught up on a lot a lot of things. But there were entertainment from all facets of the industry. Everyone just gravitated and went online around the world. And then mm -hmm. Cisco became so huge um in 2020. I know, um, it's crazy. People right? gravitated to disco like nothing ever before. Um and I believe it's because disco is a happy music. Um and then you had Dua Lipa that uh, came out with Levitation, sounds like disco. Uh, the Korean group, I forget what their names are, BK7, uh, if, that's, um, if I'm not mistaken. And they came out with a Dynamite. And then the flurry of Donna Summer remixes. And so disco came back, and I started thinking, well, this is interesting, where everyone is gravitated to music and entertaining each other, and we're all getting ourselves through this, si this situation where literally coming into contact with, with, with this virus and it's either life or death. And it was for many people, Oof. unfortunately. And um, so I realized that all this great music, but there's nobody dancing in the clubs. What, what's up? What's with that? And so the more I thought about it, I went, oh, Jesus, this is interesting that we're all inside. Music is playing everywhere, but all the clubs and social, you know, theaters, all venues are just completely dark. So then I just started writing, and I wanted to write. I wrote a, 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 I wrote a few songs, but this one in particular that I just that I just released uh, in late May called "Dance Again" mm -hmm. was more was more about a, an anthem for us to come out and dance. Have let me show let me show everybody what it is. This is his new single, but we're going to talk about it again later. But I wanted him to bring this up to speed while he was in. COVID era as to what's going on. And he concentrated on recording, which well, was concentrated, but also getting, I had to get myself through PTSD after losing so many friends. That's another thing. A great number of people. And, um, well, was, uh, I don't know. I was talking on the phone, speaking on the phone with my backup singer, Kiki. And I was sort of like real depressed and, you know, that I've lost so many people, like really like going into over a dozen people in the greater New York area. Why me? Why this and that? And she said, it's not about you, Felipe. It's about you have traveled the world less than I have. So therefore, I don't know that many people like you do. You have traveled the world. Your tree is, the roots are entrenched into the earth and your branches are wide, spread wide. You know more people than I do. So this is why you, so she put it into into in, in retrospect, she clicked it right back into focus. And I realized, wow, I'm like fortunate to have had them in my life. 
and know them, but the sadness of them going and losing their lives because of this COVID-19. And now we have a three or four variants starting to f- flourish again. No, I don't really. Don't. Yeah, All right, we'll, we'll leave know. it like that. All right, let's go. We'll kick the show and kick it up a notch. You know. Let's go. Ready? Here we go. Yeah. So, so here we are. What? Seventeen months later, and you know, I love that there are concerts everywhere. Um, there are some cancellations with a lot of venues. Um, the Mirage in Brooklyn. Are you familiar with it? Yes, I they, think they've watching. gone back to having mad dancing again you know, in, outside, and that's a really amazing place. I think Tony Miranda's played there. Mm, no, yeah, they've had Black Coffee. They've had so many different DJs play. Uh, the right. last, all the European I, guys coming in. I did catch you one Friday. I did catch you one Friday. I believe it was either June or in July. Yeah, June, yeah. Carrying up the place. You were playing... I forget who jumped into the booth with you to, to say hi to the camera. <laughs> you were, the camera was behind you, but you had that place going. Yeah, that was good because, you know what, we were just coming out of all that remission. And like That's we, it, yeah. People were like, I can't that. believe we could dance again. And then as we're in the middle of the summer and dealing with everything else, now it's like, what do we do when it gets cold again? But we'll, we'll see. I guess we're going to play it by ear, you know, or play it by the health of what's going on. But one thing I want to ask you is, before I even ask you the first question, we talk about COVID losing a lot of people at the same time in the 80s. You had, I remember this being spoken about. When it first came out, they called this thing called the grid. What they called the gay man's cancer, if you remember. The oh, yes, right. The grid. I remember hearing that word. I didn't know what the hell they meant. Yo, he's got the grid. I'm like, but they didn't have a name for it yet. Uh, right. So some of my other friends said this reminds them. The, uh, but the difference is it's not as it wasn't an airborne thing, but the people being lost to it. Just the, the, the memories, the, whole, the optics. It was the optics and the feeling of all. Of, if you experienced that era, the AIDS era. Um, and you happen to live through that and go through all the and go through all the visuals and the yeah. protest rallies and it got to the point that you know in New York there were people who just were just the hundreds were dying a day and so it was frightening and so this situation with this lockdown really took us to back to to that to that feeling of the the of the people being in you know. And this living in despair and and living alone and dying sometimes alone because gay marriage wasn't even uh, uh, possible, really possible. Exactly. Here's something, though, you know, um, you mentioned. And what about like, for example, major clubs like Paradise Garage, the Saturday Night, Gay Night. Also, the other club, you know, where Robbie Leslie played as well. Uh, I was going to say Trocadero in San Francisco. A lot of the oh, games, wow, yeah. That 80, let's say 86, 87, 88 lost most of its members. They were, they were getting back the, the uh, cards for, for the membership drives. Deceased. Deceased. Oh, yeah. the membership for the clubs? Remember, they would, they would send out the membership cards to everybody to, re, to redo yeah. the membership. And they were getting returns. Deceased, moved away, deceased, gone. I'm sure that the same thing must have happened. So I mean, the saint, I'm the talking saint, about the saint. At the saint, at the saint, yeah, yeah. 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 Um, How, like, at that time, so, you know, here we are now with this, where you're saying, here's what the memory for me is. You know, we talk about the mail. Facebook became, like, our newscaster because people would be putting stuff up. Such and such is gone. Such and such is like, it, was an, it became an overture. Uh, uh, yeah. Every day. Every day. Every day. It's like, I don't even want to look at it no more. I, I like, had to play music constantly in the house, like literally, and, and Netflix myself, Netflix myself to, you know, into oblivion. But I mean, you know, some, some days were like, you know, nights and nights were days, and Tuesday was a Friday. It didn't make any sense. I still can't believe that we went through, uh, 16 months of, 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 you know, 
of, of this situation. But, you know, we have the music and we have the things that make us joyful. And so for that, we're blessed that if we can just, if we have to do it again, then we have to do it again. I'm not, I'm not yeah. mad. No, no, you're, you're going to do what you got to do to survive. That's pretty much it. You've already yeah. survived the other stuff. You're not going to screw this up now. You're going to do what they're going to tell you to do. I know that. Right. All right. So first question, and it's the main question. How does music find the young Felipe as a kid? Or or should I say the music find you or you find the music? No, the music found me. I mean, I, I, I ended up, I was born into it with my mother. My Puerto Rican mother, she left Puerto Rico when she was, I believe, seven years old. And so she grew up in New York. And uh, it was while cutting class out of, I don't can't remember if it was high school. Yeah, cutting class in high school, she took off to uh, with her girlfriends. Now, mind you, when I say girlfriends, like they were literally, they were literal, literal homegirls, Italian, Jewish, and black girls together with Latinas, and they were like crews. So back in that day, if you're talking in the uh, early 50s, you know, she left Puerto Rico when she was seven. She was born in 26. So she must have, that must have been like 1932 when she left by boat to New York. So she grew up in New York. She was cutting classes and she went to audition at the Copacabana. And she ended up getting at the audition and she ended up dropping out of high school against my grandmother's wishes because my grandmother was Pentecostal. So that was like El Diablo, the devil's in the house, you know, is living with her. And so um, when, the, of course, my mother uh, got herself out of the house through all her gigs and being a Schaefer girl with her own billboard in Times Square, and she would go on weekends to, to Cuba to Havana, they would they would fly down to Miami, and then they would take boats to Havana to to the clubs like the Tropicana, and do weekends there. So my mother grew up, and then when she had me by chance meeting my my dad, who was on a construction site coming down a steel girder, uh, he was a welder. Um, I grew up with the influence of musicians always, all the time, over at the house. And when my dad met my mother, uh, he thought she was Italian. He found out she, oh, she's also Puerto Rican. And so he ran for the hills. That that wasn't meant to last, you know. And um, so here I am. And so I grew up with her in New York with the influence of salsa music, jazz music. I mean, she had the likes of Mongo Santa Maria that would be at the house, um, actors and actresses and Olga San Juan who used to dance with Carmen Miranda and stuff like that. People, those are the types of people and that she had coming to the house late at night. So as a little kid, I would be able to sit under the table and drink for free and pass out because, <laughs> you know, they would pick me up and put me back to bed. But I was like drunk, you know, every weekend I was, I, you know, can't say that today, you know, because Daifa would show up and arrest her. But, but my mother, uh, thank God that she uh, instilled in me, you know, the love of the of the mu of music, the lyric, rhythm, dance, and the expression, you know, for for all of the artistic people that she brought into in with her into my life. So you're telling me because it must have been like a plethora of craziness having all that, all those like salsa people and those stars around you. And you're so young because you don't really know different. This but I was normal. dancing to that music. I, this I is normal for you. It, it, well, it became normal. Yeah, it became normal. Like I would sometimes be in shock if a weekend went by and there wasn't a party going on. So, oh, so your mother hosted always a party at the house, basically. She would always go out. Or she would go to house parties and I could I would hide under the bed and I could see the dress dragging behind her, the black lace dress, and I could hear her spraying her hair, adding like some silver color, like white or something. She was a fashionista. More lipstick, more this, more perfume, and then she'd grab the dress, lift it, and run back out again. <laughs> wow. She Wait, was, so where did you grow up in Manhattan or I was born in Manhattan in the old Metropolitan Hospital, which was an island 
which I think is near Roosevelt Island. And um, and then I, I was raised in Brooklyn and um, Brownsville, Brooklyn. And then I think like 10 years living there. And then we moved to Coney Island and then she stayed there. And then I eventually moved her into Seagate. That was in the, in the like eight, eight, nine, in the 1980s. I moved her into Seagate, which is like a private, uh, the tip of Coney Island. Have you seen the gated town? Yeah. The gated city? Yeah. So you so my, oh, and my dad, of course, his influence with music and tribal music and f- playing food and hanging, you know, when I had him here two years ago. He was here for almost a month with me. And all he did was tell stories, native stories, play flute, tell jokes, dirty jokes a lot of times. Um, I took him to a bar down here in Asbury Park. It was called, it's called uh, Georgie's. And they're like the cheers. So the whole neighborhood is there in summer around 530 and took him and my stepmom, my Republican stepmother. <laughs> and so that the guys can meet him, everyone can meet him and her. And the bartender, especially uh, David Hoffman, came from around, walked around the bar and greeted my dad with a hug and all this. So while they're speaking, he asked my dad and they, my dad graciously greeted everyone. And so there had to be like 15 people sitting around in an L shape. And so uh, he was asked, do you have any music or songs that we, that you may have recorded that we might know? And he said, well, I have one in particular when I was in Vegas with the Duke, the Duke, John Wayne. And I and I sang this song for him and he said, you should record that, but I'm gonna need everyone's help. So he had asked all, asked all of us to just follow along and go. So everyone, I'm pounding also on the, on the, on the bar. And so he's pretending <clears throat> my throat and, and my friend David asked him, do you want something to drink? You know, no, 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 come on, sons. Come on, kids, keep going. Bum, bum, bum. And then he goes, one little, two little, three little Indians. <laughs> he came out with that. <laughs> Everyone freaking lost their minds. He just, that's what's the, what I love about the guy is that even in his 80s, he's still full of joy. He's full of, of life and, and, and his, uh, his stories of just things that either he's making up or, or things that he's going to do and, or the, the life he's lived because it's not, it, he always says, he always tells me it's not the life you, you, you leave behind. It's the life you live. You got to live your life. So you basically were destined for, for this, for this thing show somehow show in, in the Broadway show, the whole thing was going to find you somehow you've already what, came into your, into this with your mom, the whole setup, everything was laid out for you. It wasn't really laid out though, Lenny. I mean, I did work very hard for it through auditions and being at the right place at the right time. I mean, this, I will tell everyone that it, it doesn't like happen like that overnight. And I was, and I met, the uh, late producer Jacques Morali in one of the clubs where I was dancing. Some nights I would sing and then some nights I would dance and I had the, of course, the moccasins with the um, they're running a test, a national emergency test. How bizarre. Anyway, and he saw me dancing at this club and he asked me um, that you know, he introduced himself to me and he asked me that, well, he told me that he wanted to do something with me. And around two o'clock in the morning, that's not something you tell a, you tell a 20 year old, you know, I was almost 21. I'm like, no, I'm not interested. And he's like, no, 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 no. I'm a producer. And it turned out that he was a producer. And so he had the Richie family with Best Let's Go in Town and the uh, Quiet Village. Remember, remember that? Uh, African Queens, that was sure. another really great sure. was good songs that also, you know, Quiet Village, used to, I could remember hearing it on Fire Island. It was just gorgeous. Um, and so basically it was just by chance, I was at the right place at the right time and I took advantage of the fact that he did want to work on a project. But I thought it was going to be like, like one project and I'm off doing something else. As we then, uh, as we do 
uh, in the world of uh, auditions and Broadway and, and concerts and stuff. We call ourselves gypsies. So I thought I was about ready to spring into the next thing. And it just kept going. The one so, album for another album. So maybe before we even go that far. So you're dancing nightly. You're doing stuff for shows. Jacques Morali comes with his French accent. I want you to be in my thing, whatever. I want to make you a superstar. I want to make you a superstar. And I said, hell, yeah, I'm already a star. In my world, in the village, in New York. Village. I'd in the clubs, Experiment 4, um, uh, Roseland, wherever I would. I was, I, I was now, born. look at him. And now, take a good look at him. He was a superstar. You know, look at him. He was already dancing, and he and I could see why people were going crazy for him. I had a good sense of who I was and what what my what, what what my where I was going. I know I knew that it was I was on a journey, and that I was going to take. I was fully going to. I was going to maximize it at to to the core, and so the group became a really good launch pad for me. But how did the but but here's the thing. He comes to you and says, I want to do something. I want to produce something. Was there, was there like you had to go meet them at the office and sit down and work yeah, out? Well, actually, he was already recording. I, he was already recording a project. Okay. Uh, he was already recording the first album with, and, and, and the. Uh, Don't miss the rest of this wonderful interview. Search for part two on the internet and listen to the rest of the story.